Uh, in approaching a film about Anthony Bourdain, what did you know about him when you started? Did you ever meet him? I never met him. Um, you know, I knew about as much as kind of your average, I know, I was kind of, I wasn't a super fan, but you know, I'd read Kitchen Confidential when it came out. I'd read Medium Raw. I liked the show, but it was really more when I started working on the show uh, Ugly Delicious with David Chang. And David and all the people in that world at Lucky Peach Magazine, which they had started, always talked about Uncle Tony being kind of the patron saint. And he did so many things to help so many people in that world, in the kind of the alternative food world, food media world. You know, when the magazine didn't have money, Tony would give them money, he'd write articles for them. Um, you know, he would help, uh, he had an imprint at a book publisher where he would help kind of writers he liked and emerging voices get their books published. I mean, he did so much in a way that most people never knew about. And when he died, um, a lot of my friends who were so close to him were just so devastated by it. I mean, everybody was devastated in a way, but I kind of saw the hole it left um, in that world that, I don't know, I, I didn't feel I guess I felt a little closer to it. But there was also part of it when, I mean, I wasn't ever thinking I was gonna make a film about him. Um, you know, that happened later when, you know, the CNN and kind of everybody in Tony's life said, well, at some point we should make a film. And they kind of brought up the idea. Um, but the thing I instantly felt, like the connection I felt with him was actually more that, oh, this guy's a documentary filmmaker, <laughs> you know, that, and that, the battle he's been fighting all along is like the same battle I've been fighting. You know, I've been making films about, largely about culture, you know, and I've kind of been a, you know, whether it's music or film or food or anything, like I'm interested in the ways, I think of culture as the way we define ourselves and how we define other people. And it's kind of this great kind of unmeasurable force that gets discounted. And I feel like Tony was somebody who was kind of so on, he, he had such a, a bully pulpit that he used so well to show how culture actually connects us. And so I felt like he was one of the good guys fighting the righteous battles. You know, and when he left, my greatest sadness was, who the fuck else is gonna do that? Like he was just filling a hole. He was showing more of the world to America than anybody else in television, maybe anybody else, period. And showing more of America to the rest of the world because his show was so widely watched internationally too. So like that is no small achievement. No, and I'm curious too in terms of, you know, he was a hero to so many people beyond, you know, obviously in the food world and even in people who were never in the food world but just kind of admired his ability to link cultures and to travel so much and he was seen to have this kind of ideal life. And what, you know, Clearly, we know, you know we know that wasn't the case. But did you? F how did you have to approach that? Was that something where his darknesses were already well understood by his friends, oh. or was it a oh question like was like an uncovering? No, I mean if you go back and reread Kitchen Confidential, it is so fucking dark. <laughs> it is so dark. Um, I mean, there's this passage in Ki Kitchen Confidential um, where he he imagines his own death. And of course, because it's Tony, he tells it in this funny way. He says, someday if I'm crossing the street, I'm paraphrasing, of course, and I get hit by an ice cream truck, and I'm lying there dying in the street, and they're pulling the fender out of my you know, stomach, and I'm dying, am I gonna regret the meals I didn't eat, the places I didn't go, the experiences I didn't have? No, what I'm gonna regret is how I disappointed the people that love me in my life. And I just, I was like, oh my God, like it's, the exact same shit he was dealing with his whole life. It never really changed. You know, I mean, that's that quote that um, a friend of his says in the film, which is, there's a circularity to it. It wasn't kind of, where did this come from? It's like, oh, it's back. You know, it's like, this is kind of this collision course he was on for a long time. And I mean, I, I didn't put it in the film, but I talked to a lot of people about what, what would have happened, it's an unknowable, but. If you think about it, what would have happened if Kitchen Confidential had never come out? Mm -hmm. If he had never had that whole second act of his life? And a lot of his friends said, 
he wouldn't have lasted. No. Yeah. No, it's, it's clear. It's clear that he wouldn't have. I thought one of the things that was really powerful was that you you make the point that he is somebody who was you know he was an addict, never f successfully dealt with it a hundred percent, but just kind of felt dif found different addictions to fill the hole, and um, you know there was a lot you know when he when he died there was a lot of gossip about um, Asia uh, you know somehow being responsible in some way because of breaking up and there was another guy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, to me, when I saw it, and when I saw it, I was like, no, it is so self-evident that he, she was the obsession du jour. She, oh, yeah. yeah. 100%. 100%. I mean, he, he was looking at that point. I mean, the way, and I don't think it's an overly simplistic way to look at it because, I mean, I think it was kind of borne out again and again that this idea that he would have this domestic life was this romantic idea. I mean, he was such a romantic, um, and he wanted everything to be this, like the rom romantic vision of a 50s TV dad you would see in a movie. You know, like he had to be that or else he couldn't be a dad. And everything was like that. It had to be the kind of quintessential romantic idea of something. And I think when that wasn't gonna work out for him, He's like, well, then I'm just, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Like, I just want to go back to living on the edge more. I mean, he literally starts smoking again, starts drinking heavily. The leather jacket is back. His voice changes. I mean, if really in the last... His voice changes? Yeah. I mean, the last... It's funny because going through all of his voiceovers for all the years, literally the last year, his voice drops a register. Um and I think it's just, I mean, both he's starts smoking heavily. He's just not, he's definitely on, he's looking for trouble. I mean, it's, it's that. And it's something that people in his life knew. People out in the world didn't know it, but people around him were very worried. He started, I mean, his wife kind of refers to it, his, uh, uh, Atavia, who he'd been separated from, but she mentions that Tony, only about 10 weeks before he killed himself, started therapy for the first time in his life. So, I mean, the signs were there that he needed help, and everybody saw it. Um, you know, the Aussie of it was just a, a symptom of the problem. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's super clear. Um, did you feel, this is gonna sound strange, but did you feel in a way like almost like a shaman in terms of talking to these people and, help, and bringing out their feelings about him? Because it seems like there's like, everybody knew different parts of him. Yeah. No one knew him entirely. And it seems like there was an element of discovery that was going on throughout it. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's interesting because um, the last two films I made before this, one was about Mr. Rogers and one was about Orson Welles. And I get lots of questions about, you know, what was, it wasn't, how was Tony like Mr. Rogers? And like, he was in no way like Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Um, but he was a lot like Orson Welles. Self-destructive, uh, this kind of... Um, protean figure who showed a slightly different face in every situation to every person and everybody that knew him had a different relationship with him. I mean, I see so many similarities more with Orson and that type of a character that people, even the teams he worked with, he had three primary teams he worked with, you know, Tom and, and Michael Steed and Morgan, his three main directors. He had vastly, you know, radically different relationships with all of them, you know, kind of the like bro-y brother with one, the like stern father with one, you know, and just, it was how he was. I mean, even within his teams in the production, he had very different ways of dealing with people. And, um, and so in doing the interviews, I mean, the interviews were, I've said this before, I mean, they were insanely hard. Um, Why were they, what made them hard? Just, it was, it's funny because I mean, the documentary making is always some part of therapy, <laughs> you know, it's, and I tell people that often, and that's therapy for me as well as therapy for the people doing this with me. But a lot of, a lot of people had not even really thought about what they thought. Um, certainly hadn't ever talked about what they thought. So for instance, Chris and Lydia, uh, his two main producers who he started with and who worked with him and ran the company forever. Um, who are married. I interviewed Lydia the first day, 
I interviewed Chris at the very end, but Lydia, and she said, I've never talked to Chris about any of this. They said, when Tony died, we were just scrambling to kind of figure out what that meant to our business and to all of our employees. And there was so much to deal with that we never took the time or wanted to go through kind of the, the pain of just like having a real sit down and talking about what it felt and what it meant. And I felt a version of that every time. I and mean, particularly when it comes to something like suicide, you feel like you don't often have permission to just talk to your loved ones or to other people about the complicated feels because suicide, implies all these horrible things like guilt in terms of people in, in your life. And um, so I showed up and I was like, <laughs> let's talk about everything. Suicide. Yeah, I mean, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, um, but it was everything. It was like, the interviews were became the longest interviews I've ever done. And I'm so grateful that people talked and talked the way they did. I think there was this certain feeling and several people, I think Otavia says in the film, but many people said it to me while doing the interview that I'm never gonna talk about this again publicly. Like there was just the sense of like, this is the one time for me to put it out there and then I don't ever have to do it again. Who was hard to get to talk? Um, I mean, somebody like Eric, I mean, uh, people were suspicious. Eric was suspicious. Um, and we had a conversation beforehand. And um, it was kind of like, what, what are your intentions? You know, like, what are you trying to do with this? And, and after he saw the film, he sent me an email that was like probably the best thing I ever read about the film. And he wrote it in this dramatic way where he's like, I remember when we first talked, you asked, you know, I asked you what your intention was. And you said it was really just to try and understand the man and to make something that you think you would be proud of in a way. And he said, and you did it. And it's beautiful, and thank you. And I was like, <laughs> you could have said that in the first sentence. <laughs> I was a little nervous. <laughs> um, but that's one of those feelings of like, um, in many ways, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of in the trust business of, you know, to ask people to open up like that and to share those thoughts and then to kind of put them into a movie and share them with people. Um, you're not, you don't wanna, you wanna honor the complexity of those feelings. And, um, you know, I mean, I felt such a burden on this film, you know, a burden with the people in the film, the burden with the people I interviewed, but also a burden and a responsibility with the public because everybody felt they knew Tony and felt they, you know, that they had a version of Tony I mean, even if you talk to people, you know, there's people that think Kitchen Confidential is the Tony or the TV Tony or, you know, that they grab onto different parts of them, you know. So even the public had this kind of fractured way of relation, uh, having a relationship with him. Um, so there was definitely a sense of don't fuck it up. Um, <laughs> but at a certain point, it's, it's a suicide mission because you're never going to, you can't do everything. You know, you can't appease everybody, and nor should you. And for a long time, really in the beginning, I remember saying, you know, I want to make a film that I think Tony would really recognize himself in and that he would be proud of. And I spent a lot of time getting the DNA of it right. I mean, part of it was like, that was the fun part, is, you know, I made this 22-hour playlist of every song he ever mentioned, um, which I listened to and shared with everybody making the film. Every movie he mentioned, you know, we all, all of us working on the film, watched them, and like that was a, like he had great taste in music and great taste in movies and books, same thing. So going everything read from you know Graham Greene to Joseph Conrad to Hunter Thompson, like going back through all that stuff, um, just to feel. And we put all these little bits of it, little like the shot I know he loved from A Weary Wrath of God or whatever. These tiny little moments. I was like Tony would have loved that. <laughs> like he just, you know, or even a lot of the songs. You know, virtually all the music comes from that 21 hour playlist of things that, that I knew meant something to him. You know, I'm like using the Modern Lovers at the beginning, who was like such a band that he loved and an album he loved and a song he loved. And, um, and that playlist is on Spotify, right? It is on Spotify, <laughs> if you wanna check it out. Um, but then there came a point while I was making it where I said, you know what, um, as I started to talk to people, I was like, well, there's a part of this film that 
I don't think he would like, and I think he shouldn't like it, which, Be is? which is the crater he left behind. Like having to really face that. Like at a certain point, he doesn't have a perspective on his life. And at a certain point, he's so disconnected from perspective on his life that he kills himself, unaware of what that does, the, mm -hmm. the profound impact that had on the people in his life. And I think part of it is me making this film, you know, three years after he died and, and just the experience of talking to these people. But I felt like I had to honor that. Like maybe if this film was made 10 years from now, it wouldn't be so raw. But my experience of making it was such a raw experience that I just felt like I had to, I had to honor that because that's what they gave to me. So I was kind of giving it back in the film. And I mean, I think Tony should have heard all those things. But, you know, he never had the chance to. You know, um, there was an interview that I read. I can't remember where it was, but it was a, there was a question around using AI for Tony's voice. And I think you said something along the lines of, yeah, we can discuss that at an IDA panel. <laughs> so I figured I might. It's now the time. And now's the time. <laughs> well, no, I, the thing, I'll tell you, it was like when I heard about that, I heard they were like, oh, controversy, blah, 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 blah. And then I saw it, I'm like, what are you people talking about? This is like, because it's to me, yeah. it's no different than having somebody read. An actor read an act, something? An actor, yeah. yeah, an actor read the words. So I'm just kind of, I'm, I, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'll, I'll give a little, because it's the first time I've really talked about it, <laughs> certainly with a journalist, um, that in the beginning, uh, I was just thinking, part of the experience of watching Tony on television was his voice. His point of view is what made those shows. And if you actually, as I have, take his voice over out of the shows, they're very strange and melancholic <laughs> ruminations of visitations of countries around the world. And so his point of view does everything to those shows. And I just felt like to do a film and not have his point of view expressed would be wrong. And so it just wouldn't be satisfying. And so kind of my pitch from the beginning was, I mean, I said, you know, Tony loved the movie Sunset Boulevard. You know, he even reenacted Sunset Boulevard in one of his TV shows in uh, the first season of Cook's Tour. And I said, you know, Tony kind of narrating from Beyond the Grave in some way, I think would be really interesting. Um, and I talked about it with everybody in the beginning. Everybody loved the idea. And I talked about using AI because it's this emerging technology and everybody liked it. Nobody said anything about it. Uh, nobody ever had a question about it. And then we, but I mean, that wasn't my intent to just lean on it. I mean, the first thing I did is I went through every interview he ever gave, every podcast, every book on tape, every voiceover session, took every idea of his I liked, I put it into a spreadsheet, and then I sorted it by idea. And I have this 500 page binder of Tony talking about everything. And the voice that got us almost all the way there. And there were like three small passages that I didn't have. One was this description of Vietnam early on where he talks about it. It's almost like a pheromonic thing. And it's just this kind of beautiful dis description of falling in love with Vietnam that's better than what he said when he went to Vietnam the first time in the voiceover for the show. And so I used it. And, and then the letter, the, uh, the email he wrote to David Cho, which seemed obvious. Um, and it's about 45 seconds total. And, and the funny thing is, you know, I read a lot of his, it's very unusual, <laughs> very unusual to make a documentary about a subject where you have actually read hundreds of memos they've written on edits <laughs> and what they think, you know, what their opinions are about things. And basically to synthesize Tony's opinion on how to approach an edit is break every fucking rule. If you play it safe, you failed, be punk rock, you know, take no prisoners, um, you know, challenge all the norms. And so I was like, well, you know, here we go. Tony's telling me to do this. Um, and, and I'm still, I'm still glad we did. You know, I, I stand by it. So. I 100%. Yeah, I thought it was awesome. Thank you.